What this member fails to realize is the government is actually the complainant in this. In his letter to Canadians, the Prime Minister in 2015 famously promised the following. It is time for leadership that never seeks to divide Canadians, but takes every single opportunity to bring us together. Miss Truth. We're committed to a responsible, transparent fiscal plan for challenging economic times. Another mistruth. Canadians need to have faith in their government's honesty and willingness to listen. Another mistruth. Government and its information, let that sink in. Government and its information must be open by default. Simply put, it is time to shine more light on government. But in order for you to trust your government, you need a government that will trust you. When we make a mistake, as all governments do, it is important that we acknowledge that mistake and learn from it. To close, I am committed to leading an open, honest government that is accountable to Canadians' lives, lives up to the highest ethical standards, brings our country together, and applies the utmost care and prudence in the handling of public funds. And he closed that letter to Canadians with the phrase, we will not let you down. The Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, has reneged on all of those promises. He's a failed leader. He's abused his trust. This failed corrupt government has literally been embroiled in scandals after scandals for the last nine years. And here we go again, talking about another scandal, this time the Green Slush Fund. As a result, the House of Commons has been at a standstill for 13 days now due to this government's refusal to hand over documents. Over the past weeks, we've engaged in countless debates regarding this privilege motion. I can only assume that Canadians have been bombarded with a barrage of differing views and misleading narratives surrounding the government's Green Slush Fund. Given that the parliamentary press gallery often shies away from highlighting liberal corruption, I want to lay out the facts clearly and simply for those who are watching. It all began with SDTC in 2017, which was supposed to provide funding to companies with innovative and legitimate ideas aimed at improving Canada's environmental record. The government funneled a staggering billion tax dollars into SDTC However, the Liberals appointed their friends to the board of SDTC, including the chair, which is responsible for deciding who receives uh, funds. And what did these board members do when they convened? They chose to redirect that money back to their own companies, a shocking $400 million not spent on enhancing environmental outcomes, but rather on enriching Liberal insiders. In addition, a further $58 million was granted to 10 projects that were entirely ineligible and couldn't even demonstrate any environmental benefits or the utilization of green technology. The Ethics Commissioner determined that the chair of this board twice broke the law by funneling money to her own company. So how do we know all of this? Well, a brave whistleblower stepped forward and testified at committee, exposing this damning and explosive scandal. To quote him directly, what should have been a straightforward process turned into a bureaucratic nightmare that allowed SDTC to continue wasting millions of dollars and abusing countless employees over the last year. Further, they also expressed that they believe that the government is more interested in protecting themselves and preventing the situation from becoming a public nightmare." End of quote. Instead of this Prime Minister upholding his mandate of running an open, honest and transparent government, he and his Liberal colleagues are paralyzing Parliament by refusing to release all unredacted documents and evidence related to the Green Slush Fund. This is not just a matter of ethics, it's about the integrity of our democratic institutions. Canadians deserve to know how their tax dollars are being spent and who is benefiting from these decisions. 
This refusal to hand over documents can only mean that what they are hiding is far worse than we can imagine. Which particular cabinet minister are they trying to protect from criminal liability? Just how damning are these documents that they would stall Parliament for 13 days and defying your order, Mr. Speaker, just to conceal the $400 million they handed to their friends? Clearly what they are trying to conceal is prioritized above the very productivity of Parliament itself. Now, the government House leader and several other Liberal champions of corruption like to defend and deflect their failure to comply with the Speaker's order to release documents by saying that Conservatives are somehow trampling upon charter rights. This is a, any claps. This is a blatant attempt to shift focus away from the Liberals' reckless spending and corruption, a far too common tactic for this government. You think they would know what it means to attack charter rights as their unprecedented use of the Emergency Act allow them to freeze bank accounts without court orders, authorize broad police powers, and restrict peaceful assembly. Even civil liberty organizations and former judges at that time raised alarm bells saying there was no justification for such extreme measures. And then we had Justice Mosley and the Federal, Court of, the Federal Court of Appeal who pronounced that the government uh, essentially breached a number of charter rights. So why should Conservatives heed the Liberals' advice on respecting the Charter? They only uphold it when it aligns with their political agenda. Their track record reveals a blatant disregard for the very rights they now claim to champion, all to deflect responsibility for their misuse of taxpayer funds. When it comes to protecting individual freedoms, Conservatives lead with principles, while Liberals pick and choose when it benefits their agenda. The invocation of the Emergencies Act wasn't about protecting Canadians, it was about silencing criticism and crushing opposition. The same applies now as we demand accountability for the Green Slush Fund. The Liberals are raising concerns that the Speaker's House order could infringe on charter rights, especially regarding police investigations and privacy. But let's be clear, Mr. Speaker, it's the Liberals who are abusing their power by refusing to comply with an order of this House. They claim we are violating specifically Section 8 of the Charter, which protects privacy from unreasonable search and seizure. However, the truth is there is little to no expectation of privacy in these documents. They were created by public servants spending taxpayer money. They belong to the public. Furthermore, the House order doesn't force the RCMP to take any specific action on the documents. Law enforcement can choose to disregard them if they see fit. However, if they find evidence of potential criminality, they must pause their review and obtain judicial authorization to continue. This, protest, sorry, this process protects any claims of a charter breach. The charter is there to protect people from the government, not to protect the government from accountability. What we're witnessing is a clear attempt by the Liberals to dodge accountability for their actions concerning the SDTC and taxpayer funds. As Conservatives, we are committed to transparency. Canadians deserve to know how their money is being spent. We will always stand against overreach and demand accountability from this government. Pursuing transparency is not an infringement on rights. It's essential to our democracy. Mr. Speaker, I've had the opportunity to sit on many committees regarding SDTC and the Liberals' Green Slush Fund. I've been watching this unravel for quite some time now. Considering all the testimony we've heard, the ministers we've spoken to, the numerous reports from the Auditor General, it's completely mind-boggling that they, this government and its members are still trying to cover this up. Despite the overwhelming evidence revealing the depths of this corruption scandal, the Liberals continue to evade accountability. They are avoiding it so fiercely that they are willing to stall the work of Parliament. 
diverting our attention from the critical issues that matter most to Canadians. Issues like soaring housing costs, food insecurity, rising crime rates, increasing drug use, and the growing homeless, homeless, homelessness crisis. This is nothing short of shameful. The Liberals continue to tell the press that they are eager to move past this debate, claiming it is the Conservatives who are wasting time and resources. Let me remind them, they are the only members of this House who voted against this motion, that they alone possess the power to resume parliamentary proceedings. They could refocus on the issues that matter to Canadians by simply handing over all unredacted documents. It's as simple as that. Instead, they choose to hide behind procedural delays, prioritizing their own political survival over the urgent needs of everyday Canadians. This is a government that has completely tired and lost touch with reality, more concerned with covering their tracks than addressing the struggles of the citizens they were elected to serve. Perhaps this can serve as a wake-up call to this government. Recent polling from Abacus Data paints a stark picture of the growing discontent among Canadians. A staggering 57% of those living in Liberal-held ridings want their Member of Parliament to call on the Prime Minister to resign and not seek re-election. Let that sink in to the Liberal members who are listening to this speech. This isn't just a minor concern, it's a clear signal from the electorate that they are fed up with the Liberals. Time is up. Moreover, only one in five Canadians believe the Prime Minister should run again. Almost half of Canadians want him to resign immediately. This is not just a rejection of his leadership, it's an entire rejection of the approach this government has taken. Among those who voted Liberal in 2021, but have since lost faith in the party, the numbers are even more alarming. A staggering 40% want the Prime Minister to resign immediately. This isn't just about political preferences, it's about accountability and trust. Accountability in the face of corruption. The evidence of mismanagement and unethical practices surrounding the SDTC and the Liberal government's green slush fund is undeniable. Canadians are tired of seeing their hard-earned tax dollars misused while the government tries to cover its tracks. The Prime Minister's unwillingness to address these issues head-on and hand over the documents has clearly eroded trust and made it clear that accountability was never a priority for him and this government. Shameful. It is shameful. The question we must now ask, how much longer will this government ignore the voices of the very people it was elected to serve? The Liberals can no longer afford to dismiss the mounting discontent as mere political noise. We know that at least 20, if not 30 members really wanted the Prime Minister to resign as of today. They must recognize that their actions have consequences and the people and Liberal members are demanding change. This data reflects a fundamental shift in the political landscape. Canadians are seeking true leadership that prioritizes their needs, not a government more focused on self-preservation and evading accountability. The public is rightly outraged at the corruption that has been allowed to fester under this Prime Minister, and it is time for the Liberals to face the reality of their situation or to step aside and give Canadians the carbon tax election they want and deserve. It's time for this, for our country to be led by Canada's next great Prime Minister, the, the member for Carleton. As Conservatives, we stand ready, as Conservatives, we stand ready to offer a vision that restores trust and accountability in government. 
it's time for the Prime Minister to listen to the people and step aside for new leadership that puts Canadians first. The call for change is loud and clear, Mr. Speaker, and Conservatives are more than ready to form government, end the corruption, end the scandals, and ensure that the voices of Canadians are heard, but more importantly, to always respect the source of the funds that drive this country taxpayer monies. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the rights of Parliament and Canadian taxpayers have been violated by this government's refusal to comply. The Speaker has ruled that the House must pause its work until the government fulfills its legal obligation to provide these documents. The Auditor General has exposed the shocking reality that the Prime Minister has turned the SDTC into a clear green slush fund for Liberal insiders with 330, sorry, $390 million paid out in 180 cases of conflicts of interest. It is unacceptable that the Prime Minister and his ministers were aware of this corruption and did nothing to stop it. That same whistleblower that I quoted earlier called out not once, not twice, but three times the Minister for Innovation, in fact, stopped nothing short of saying that he deliberately misled Canadians, he misled Parliament, that he knew about the abuse and did absolutely nothing about it until he and this Prime Minister and this corrupt government were outed by the press. The Auditor General has clearly laid the blame on the Industry Minister as well for his failure to monitor these contracts properly. When did we lose this whole concept of ministerial accountability? I read at the very beginning the words of this Prime Minister, we are going to make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, we will own up to those mistakes and we will learn from it. In my three years as a parliamentarian, I have yet to hear one apology from any member of this corrupt government. These are false words, these were false promises, and Canadians are clearly coming to the same conclusion that I certainly had, that we were basically sold a false bill of goods in 2015, 2019, and 2021. Only common sense Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, are committed to ending this corruption and getting real answers for Canadians. We will hold this government accountable. It is our constitutional obligation to do exactly what we are doing right now, and we will continue to do this as uh, ferociously as possible each and every day until this government releases the documents, all the documents, unredacted. We will restore integrity to our political system. It's time for transparency, Mr. Speaker. It's time for change. It's time for the truth. Thank you. Well Questions and comments? Uh, Kessio Kamakar, the Honourable Deputy House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Today we're talking about the production of documents uh, in relation to an RCMP investigation. And I know that this member is a former prosecutor. He never misses an opportunity to remind us of that. But my question to him is quite simple. Can he tell this House how many times in the 15 plus years that he was a prosecutor that he obtained evidence or a police organization he was working with obtained evidence through an order from Parliament? The Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. What this member fails to realize is the government is actually the complainant in this particular matter. There is clear evidence of criminality. There is clear evidence of fraud in the awarding of taxpayer money. Well, if you let me finish the response before interrupting, you might get a response that you might be satisfied with. Okay, here, here. Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. You know, they, they love to interrupt, okay? And, yeah. Well, you know... Order. Order. Okay, now remember for Brantford. What, what, what this new member for Kingston and the Islands fails to appreciate 
is that any order made from Parliament is supreme. This is the law. And what this new member from Kingston and the Islands fails to appreciate is that he and his government are the actual complainants. If there was really an interest in holding these individuals who forfeited the ability to receive funds lawfully, but did so through criminal means, then he would actually understand that there's an obligation to work with the RCMP and hand over the documents. But they're not doing so, Mr. Speaker, because clearly they're trying to protect someone on that front bench or behind that front bench. That is the only logical conclusion. They've got the ability. So the answer is, just because it's never been done before, doesn't mean, doesn't mean, Mr. Speaker, that there isn't a lawful way of releasing these documents. Questions and comments? And they'll remember Vancouver Kingsway. Prior to this Liberal, Liberal government that's been in power for nine years, the Conservatives were in power for nine years. Yep. Now, I happen to be in this House for most of that time, and in that time, under the Conservative government, there was a Phoenix pay scandal that cost taxpayers $2 billion. There was a $50 million slush fund administered by Tony Clement. There were a number of Senate scandals. The Harper government was found in contempt not once, but twice, for guess what? Twice. Refusing to hand over documents ordered by Parliament, no, 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 no. detailing how they were spending money what? on crime bills and dealing with the Afghan detainee it's matter. Yes. And there was election fraud galore. We watched Dean Del Mastro, a Conservative MP, be led off in handcuffs to jail. Oh. Uh, if we were to stand here and find out whose list of corruption and scandals was longer between the Liberals and Conservatives, we'd be here all day. <laughs> but the question I have from my honourable colleague is this. The Speaker has ruled an agreement with the Conservatives to produce documents to PROC. There is no order to produce all of the documents to this House, to the police. If my honourable colleague wants such an order, why don't they raise a, a question of privilege and ask the Speaker to order production of all the documents to the police, or is it because they know that the Speaker will not do that? That's a great question. The Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. It's so good to know that the coalition is alive and well. The member just confirmed that. And literally, Mr. Speaker, my observations at a number of committees and listening to NDP members who again always talk about this this failed, tired government, this ethically challenged government, continue and will always continue to support their phony, their phony leader who did that stunt in front of Canadians and ripped up a piece of paper that he claims was the agreement, clearly was just a stunt within a few days of a by-election. If he actually cared about, about actual taxpayer money, and 400 million, at least 400 million for one scandal, he would stand behind the conservative position and demand that we end this privilege motion by getting this government to release all of those documents unredacted, if he actually cared. Questions and comments, the Honorable Member for Beauport Limolu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to hear that my colleague. Uh, well, has spoken. I worked with him on the committee, the, the almighty Ogo, like they like to say. So it's a pleasure to hear him speak today. But at the beginning of this question of privilege, we heard the government say that there was an intrusion in the division of powers, that they cannot uh, give an order to investigate, so then there's an intrusion. And the second reason they provided for not giving the documents was saying, well, no, there is no search warrant, but here's my question. Do you really need a warrant to have the right to submit potential evidence? No, no, no. The Honourable Member for Brentford Brent. It is a tool, and I firstly, I want to thank my member for that very thoughtful, uh, actual thoughtful, the first thoughtful question I was actually presented with, so I do thank her for that. Um, obtaining search warrants is, is one particular tool that law enforcement uh, can use, but they only will rely upon search warrants where there is no cooperation uh, in an investigation, particularly from a complainant. 
So as I indicated in my speech and in my responses to, uh, to a couple of questions, this government is the complainant. They have a duty to ensure they are releasing documents to assist the RCMP in their investigation. So search warrants are a tool, but not required to obtain each and every piece of evidence. As I've also indicated in my speech, if the RCMP receives all the documents unredacted, if there is a concern that there was no judicial authorization, it's called the discoverability rule, Mr. Speaker, as they're reviewing material, if they have a suspicion of some level of criminality, they are legally bound to stop the review, right to a justice for judicial authorization to continue that review and then potentially lay those charges.